Hey guys, my name is Wendy J. Olson. I'm your host. This season, we're changing things up a bit. We'll still be hearing some amazing stories from incredible women, but I'll also be sharing more about my insight into work as a healing coach. This season is packed with stories of survivors and thrivers, overcomers, and some of us just still walking through the messy middle. So don't feel left out at all. None of us have arrived, and we're all in this together. This is She's Got Gumption. We're so glad you're here. Pull up a chair. There's plenty of room at our table. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of She's Got Gumption. This week on the podcast, I have my girl, Simi. Simi Shinowo is a photographer who prides herself on brand imagery and the ability to tell a story, not just take a picture. Um, She runs her company Uche Brand Imagery out of Austin, Texas. She was born in the U.S., but at an early age moved back to her parents' hometown in Nigeria. She was raised there and attended school until graduating high school at the age of 16. Being the oldest in her family, she was responsible for the care of her younger siblings. This and many other cultural differences brought about how she continues to show up in this world. While challenging, of course, she's grateful for all the ways God has molded her into the woman we get to meet today. Grab your notepad. This girl drops some knowledge that will blow your mind. Here's my conversation with Simi Shinoa. Hey, Simi. Hey, Wendy. What is up? Uh, well, let me see the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> That is what is up. So is Simi short for something? Yes. Simi. (laughs) Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, Okay. Simi is short for (laughs) Owosimiwai. I love that. What does it mean? It means money escorted me into the world. Um, I was born when my dad got his first job. So, um, and I'm Nigerian by birth. Well, both my parents are Nigerian, so I'm Nigerian. And so we get named for the circumstances under which we were born. So there we have it. <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah. So each child has their own, like, name and, like, the purpose. Not the purpose, but, like... Circumstances, yeah, yeah like... That yeah. they were brought into the world. That is so Yes, cool. yeah. Like, are there unfortunate names? Like, are people like, oh, my gosh, what's your name mean? And somebody's like, I'm not telling you. Like, <laughs> It's not good. Um, I don't think they're unfortunate names. I think they're just names that, you know, you know how kids are. Like, if they're jealous of you, they'll make your name sound horrible or awful. Just, yeah. Kids so, yeah. I'm like, for a long time, I hated my name. But, you know, that's just kind of like part for the course. <laughs> I, I hated my name for a while, too. I wanted to be like every other Jennifer, Allison, and Ashley out there, you know? I mean, I wanted to be one of the five in the classroom that all had the same name. Because I thought it was good. <laughs> <laughs> like as you get older you're like my name's cool because nobody else has it so you know the fun thing was um in college having like the chemistry classes that have like 600 people in it and like the the instructor is calling roll and he goes and goes and then like he stops dead in his tracks I'm like that's me <laughs> <laughs> okay my little cousin her name is Siobhan Fedoric okay <laughs> is a Gaelic name, uh-huh. originated in Ireland, S-I-O-B-H-A-N. Yeah. And Fedoric is a Ukrainian name. And mm-hmm. so like on her senior night, like we're all there at the, the football game mm-hmm. and they're going through each one and they stop. <laughs> like, That's me because they're like, uh. <laughs> like, Man. Yeah. That was the name that was, I was, you know, and it was kind of fun because my instructors would actually know me because you know, you can't just like look at a name like that and go, yeah, I don't know what that, yeah, I don't know how to say that. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, can you give everyone just the five minute cliff notes of who you are, what you're about, and then we'll dive into your story. Um, Let me see. Oh, gosh, who am I? Well, I'm, I love Jesus. And I'm so grateful for, you know, him on the cross. and just saving me from what my life could have been and just the crazy that I got to experience. Um, And what I'm about, I'm pretty much someone who's been carved as a connector Mm. and um, that pulls, 
I love the way someone said it that calls the gold up out of other people. Um, cause it's, it's really easy. And I find myself doing this sometimes is it's really easy to, um, call people by their aliases, like names that are given to them because they're misbehaving and that's not really who they are. Um, and I need to be better about calling the gold out of people, but pretty much hanging with the Lord. He's like, that's what I've called you to do is to, you know, to call the gold up out of people because you can see the bad stuff, but it's not, um, it's not edifying and it doesn't show my character. Speaking of the Lord's, um, when I call people by their, by the aliases. So, yeah. So that's, you know, I'm really good at doing that with other people for myself. Well, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. it's so much easier to encourage somebody else, but yeah. to look in the mirror and be like, you are awesome. You know, like the guy on Saturday yeah. night live. You are, you are, and everybody loves you. Or what? I can't even remember. What yeah, you yeah. I, just, I, I remember the the clip, the um, clip you're talking about. I'm just like, <laughs> it just feels weird. I don't know, but you know, <laughs> it's so much easier to talk bad about ourselves. That's just how it is. Well, I'm actually changing the way I talk about myself because you know, yes, you know, the Lord is on me about that. He's like, no. Your words are powerful and you yeah. need to stop saying those things. So I was really young and I realized that you could hear what I was saying. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I can't talk bad about myself, like appearance wise or just in general at all. Cause she's going to pick up mm -hmm. on that. And then it's hereditary words have power. Yeah, absolutely. So can you share with people what you do for a living? Well, <clears throat> what I do for a living besides just having a blast and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> generally looking for the fun in everything and all the bright colors. Um, I'm a storyteller. Uh, just I'm starting to like walk in that realization more and more. I, you know, I would say it a while ago, but I'm more now I, I really have gotten to the point where I'm like, yeah, I own this. This is what I do. Um, and I tell stories for like brands and weddings and portraits. And my thing is all about like legacy and heirloom and, you know, family stories being passed along and business stories and, you know, all the things. Um, and the end product usually looks like, um, you know, photos, of course, or images um, for brands or weddings or portraits. So I'm definitely not the storyteller that gives you images that you could just Photoshop the heads of different people and get the, the images. They're always very different. So that's what I do. Primarily. That's powerful because I was a photographer in another life and it's, it's all about capturing like that moment. It's not like here, look at the camera and say cheese, right? Mm -hmm. like, let's capture the moment. Like let's capture the personality image bearer of God. Right. Yeah. So cool. I love the way that you describe that and own that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Um, you know, I, I think it was, a couple years ago when everybody's like, oh, we could do mini sessions. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to try it, but I think I'm going to hate it. But yeah. if I never tried it, I wouldn't, you know. And my thing is always about getting to know the people and getting to know their stories and, you know, putting that out there. And you don't have enough time. <clears throat> and so I have always hated mini sessions. <laughs> so... So my so people are like you don't do mini sessions. I'm like no, I have perfect photographer for you, but I'm not yeah. the storyteller. No, oh <laughs> so. my gosh, um, I worked for J.C. Penney doing like portraits. You know, oh what I mean? good lord, and that's like they're like get them in and get them out in five minutes. I'm like, I do, that's that's insane. Are you freaking kidding me? This is not <laughs> McDonald's. Like McDonald's <laughs> fast, but you know the quality you're getting, like. Through the, like I just I'm like oh I can't oh, this is this is not, okay. <laughs> not where I belong. <laughs> yes. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? So I am from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Um, I was like I said earlier, I was born to two Nigerian parents. Um, who were who met actually in the United States <clears throat> when they were in um in school. And um, they got married and it was kind of interesting because 
my mom's from the east and my dad's from the west and they were in the middle of the country was in the middle of a civil war um so they got married from on you know from being on two sides of the same civil war um and that just didn't happen in their generation so that created a very interesting family dynamic if you will i'm sure <laughs> yeah so um but i was born stateside um and we were here till I was about four ish. And then my parents moved home because they were they um they graduated like in the middle of the civil rights movement. <clears throat> and both of them were doing their internships. And my dad had some actually both my parents had very very interesting experiences with racism and they were like, yeah, we don't have to deal with this. We're just going to go back to our home country. <laughs> so, Can you share a little bit about their experience? Um, so my, um, my dad was, well, my dad was an internist and um, he was an internist. So he, you know, he dealt with like primarily older patients and he dealt with like surgery and, you know, heart attack patients and whatnot, trying to help them. And um, I think he's, the, the story I remember is a woman got wheeled into the emergency room and my dad was the only doctor on call that had the qualifications to deal with um, looking at her to make sure <clears throat> what, you know, to, to try and diagnose what her issue was so that she didn't like die. Mm -hmm. And um, so my dad went in, um, to look her over and literally she was like one of those old women with like a black umbrella <laughs> she, was, okay. she was swinging an umbrella at my dad like oh to keep her keep him from coming near her because you know he was a black man ever and um my dad you know kind of weathered that and made sure that he did his job but after that he started he started really seriously thinking about you know going home because yeah. he he's like, I don't have to deal with this. <laughs> exactly. This is, yeah. this is not my scene. I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. feeling like, yeah. Yeah. So they move back. Um, they moved. Yeah. They moved back to Nigeria. Uh, Were you born well, yet or no? Yeah, I was born. Um, actually it was two of us, me and my sister. And they moved back to Nigeria to work for one of the larger teaching hospitals in Lagos, which is where my parents live. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that was really interesting. And I think they did like some sort of internship that you have to do, like when you're coming from a different country or whatever. And um, the rest of my life, my parents had their own um, clinic, hospital. So they had. Um, places where they could have patients stay if they needed to stay overnight in the hospital or be um, operated on. Um, and with my mom being an OB, an OBGYN, <laughs> um, she, she had to deliver babies. So, you know, they had to have a place for women to come and stuff. So sometimes they would deliver in the hospital and sometimes they would deliver at the clinic. It just kind of depended on what was going on. So, yeah. That's so cool. So are they still there? Well, my dad is with Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, I'm sorry for me, but for him, I know he's, he's having a blast. Um, and yeah, I, I miss my dad. What else can I say? He was the best one. Um, the only one I had, but he was the best one as far as I was concerned, right? How long ago did you meet your dad? Uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Still fresh. Yeah. So, um, you know, you're like, oh, I need to call dad and tell him. Wait a minute. Oh. Not here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I still have those. And I have friends that are like, yeah, I've lost my parent. You know, I have, my parent died like 10, 12 years ago and I still do the same thing. So it, it's not going to change necessarily. You just have a new normal and the Lord knows. Um, but, um, so there's that. And both my parents retired like, I want to say five or 10 years ago. And retirement meaning, <laughs> meaning they just work for free. <laughs> ah, okay. Doing the same stuff they look. Anyways, 
it's interesting. Um, at, when my parents retired, my dad got a, my dad was on the board for um, a hospital in his hometown, and you know he got on a couple other boards and stuff. Um, and then my mom loved doing. I mean, because she was a, she's an OBG, yeah. So she loves doing like women's education like as far as related to health issues. So she would do, she did a couple of TV shows where she was interviewed and, you know, she talked about like things that women could do on a daily basis to help with their, their health. That's so cool. Yeah. I never saw the shows, which is kind of interesting, but you know, I heard about them (laughs) because my friends are like, your mom was on TV. I'm like, okay. (laughs) Okay. Famous. I love what it. do you say to that mm, yeah you're like I know she's the coolest what can I say <laughs> yeah so, so you guys move back and you're how old at that point um I, I was like four or five when we moved home um what and that, like do you remember moving back oh I, I hear I remember stories that my parents told me about moving back but you know my sister probably remembers because she has like memory like an elephant, but, um, <laughs> but me and like, no, I was told that, you know, I would yell at cars because they use their horns and all this other stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> that's what they said. You know, <laughs> I'm like, you know how parents are. They can exaggerate. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, how long did you live there then? In Nigeria. Um, I lived in Nigeria till I graduated high school. Um, and then, uh, which was, I was about 16 when I graduated high school. Wow. And then, um, then I moved back stateside um, because I wanted to be in a computer engineering program. Um, and all, pretty much all the programs that were available to me in Nigeria were pretty new programs mm. and so and I'm like I'm a U.S. citizen I'm just gonna go stateside and and so I did yeah so that's how I moved back um to the states what's been your well let's go back mm-hmm. childhood mm. what, what was that like how would how do you feel like your childhood differed from from others was there anything like that uniquely stood out or Anything that um, that maybe you carried with you, like your in your lifetime. Well, I think I think I mean from some other American kid, it would have been hugely different because culturally, being the oldest um, kid, um, I was responsible for my siblings, um, uh, and I you know I knew certain things that my siblings didn't know. Um, and, you know, both my parents worked, so whenever they weren't, whenever they weren't home, I was responsible for, like, watching after my, my sister and my brothers, and, um, so that made it different, right, because I was the one who was helping raise my siblings, if you will. From what age did you start having that kind of responsibility? Probably, like, five or six. Wow. Yeah. Are yeah. You still, are you a caregiver by nature because of that now, or has it had like a negative impact? Actually, I actually I think I am a caregiver by nature. Um, I remember talking to someone and going, "Well, why? That doesn't make any sense." And um, and the person said, "It might not have made sense to you, and it probably wasn't what you would have wanted, but you can see that the Lord has used it to shape who you are." Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I would, you know, before, before I, I met a particular swath of friends, I would describe myself as being responsible. They're like, do not use that word around me. I do not like it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I'm like, what's wrong with being responsible? It's not a bad thing. You know, um, anyways, so that was kind of interesting. So, you know, I have, I feel like the kid that was that always asked why Mm. um and a lot of times you know people were like oh you you know the reason why you ask so many questions is because you've been in the states for so long I'm like no 
I've, I've actually always been that way my whole life. Um, and it got me in trouble sometimes. <laughs> Did you feel, were you part of like more adult conversations and kid conversations growing up because you were the oldest? Um, it was kind of interesting because there were things that I knew as a kid um, that I was supposed to know because I was the oldest um, and kind of carried a little bit of the, you know, if my parents are not available, I'm responsible for the family um, type of mantle on my shoulders, which is probably not helpful at some point. Um, but as far as being part of adult conversations, it was pretty much, you know, as a kid, you were, you were there, um, but you didn't get a chance to necessarily contribute to the conversation, if that makes any sense. Mm, no, it really does. Cause you're given that, like you, like you said, mantle, that responsibility. Yeah. Um, so you almost accept that like you should be a part of more conversations, interactions and, and things like right. that. But when you're not, then it's like, well, what's really my place here? Did yeah. you feel like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, there were times I was just like, oh, I'm really sure. <laughs> you know, it's just like you're sitting there and you're just like, um, oh, okay, I know these things, you know, and um I there were things that I knew that, you know, my siblings did not, obviously. Um like and about family or about just like the world in general? About my family, about things that had happened. Um because I was privy to things that had hap that was happening with my parents and in my extended family that the rest of my siblings did not know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, yeah, so just that, you know, responsibility, if you will, that, that I got to shoulder, it, it was kind of, it's kind of interesting. I, I uh, was talking to the Lord about it the other day and he was showing me that he used that to carve me a certain way to where I didn't, I'm somebody that if you tell me something, it doesn't leave my lips unless I have your permission to talk about it. Right. Um, so I, I find that people trust me easily yeah. um, and they share things with me that they would not normally share. And sometimes people freak out and they go, I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. I was like, mm, don't worry about it. You know, it was, I understand it, it, this has been me my whole life. So don't worry about it. It's not going anywhere unless, you know, you want me to talk about it. So. I love that you're a kindred spirit because I always give the example of like, it's, uh, I've always been the vault, right? Like I hold yeah. everyone's secrets. People are like, oh my gosh, this, yeah. is don't tell anybody after a while that vault gets full. <laughs> right. And you're like, <laughs> this vault is going to blow at any second. <laughs> yeah, there's that. People there's like, still will that. tell you their deepest, darkest secrets or like yeah. they'll ask you for advice. Like I know anything about life, please. But it's always just been like this common thing. Yeah. People will come to you, you know, for advice. Yeah. Or they tell you, you know, random things, but random strangers tell you random things about themselves. And I always give the example of like, I'm walking around the grocery store. I'm standing in line. The woman in front of me turns around and says, I just murdered my husband. I put him in the trunk of my car. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, yeah, like, like I would not. No, nope, that would not stay with me. <laughs> that would go to the cops. That would definitely go to the cops. Depend on who her husband was. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> would you mean bastard? Then sure. Like, yeah, like, yeah you know, no. Like, that would make me complicit in that. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally good not holding that secret. Mm hmm. I'm like nobody yeah. ever has told me that, but it's I know an example of like weird stuff people tell me. As the oldest, do you find yourself being a rule follower? Um, yeah, like that's my mo. I mean, that was my mo. Let me put it that way, because I'm in recovery. <laughs> yeah. Um, following. Yep. um, I, I would say that was my mo, um, and I'm in recovery because, um, I don't know. Well. I do know the, the thing about my relationship with the Lord, because, you know, he's my, he's my life right now. Um, and always, right. Um, is that I used to think that, you know, being a believer and a follower of Christ was about following the rules. Yes. Um, 
And the thing that has gotten me just, you know, sideways is, wait a minute, but the Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, those are my, (laughs) that's my tribe, you know? And Jesus is like, yeah, y'all are, you know, y'all are messed up. Basically, that was (laughs) his message for all of them. not my people. And yeah, you're not my people. And I'm like, well, Lord, what does that mean? Like, why is that not a thing? And, um, and just like, I I feel like I'm in this stage of my life where I'm deconstructing that whole thing to see that, yes, the Lord gave the law. Yes. You know, he wants us to obey him, but he doesn't want us to obey him and know things and do things without being in relationship with him. Mm. Because, you know, that is what, that is what the enemy destroyed in the garden, right? He's like, you know the stuff, you can make the decisions, you know? <laughs> and you're just like, sure, I can, you know? And you're like, wait a minute, what's going on? Um, and so just un- getting, I feel like there's layers like of the onion, right? Um, of an, of understanding. My analogy, stop taking words out of my mouth. It's, like, it's like you're telling my story right now. So yeah. The onion. But- Right. And you, so one of the things that, um, one of the things that I do is I will from time to time, um, teach Bible study for my Sunday school class. And, um, sometime last year I got to teach on Matthew seven and seven, 22 and 23, like really stuck out to me. And I'm just like, I don't know why it's, you know, it's bothering me like it is right now, but you know, it never really bothered me, but now it's, it was just like, why is this a thing, you know, um, and 20, Matthew 7, 22 and 23, and it was the one where Jesus said, you might have to look it up, but where he said, um, the people tell him, well, you know, Lord, we did miracles in your name. We healed people. We cast out demons. We, we did all these things, right? And you're just like, okay, you're doing the supernatural. What's the deal, you know? And Jesus is like, get away from me. I never knew you. Mm. And the thing that the Lord keep, kept, keeps highlighting to me is that doing the things for Jesus and not knowing Jesus in experience, right? Because you can know about a person. Like I can say, oh, you're Wendy, you're a mom, you know, you're married, you know, and I can know all these things about you, but never, never have a conversation with you never spend time with you, mm-hmm. all these other things. Um, so I can know about you, but not know you. Yeah. And, and the Lord is like, the issue is that these people know about me, but they don't know me. Mm-hmm. And the problem with what happened in the garden is that um, the enemy wanted us to have knowledge without relationship with God. So we could make the decisions ourselves apart from him. But if you, I mean, I like, I've walked through the whole, whole scripture where God is like, I will be their God and they will be my people. It has always been about being in relationship with him, yeah. being in love with him. And when you love somebody, you want to bring them to everything. Like something happens, you want to call them up on the phone right. and, like and they weren't did. right. Right. And, and you, you know, and you not, you wanting to be, to be able to make decisions without having the Lord be a part of it, um, says that you don't really love him. You know, you're just doing the thing so you can get the notoriety. But in the end, what matters is, do you have a relationship with him? Yes. Yeah. And so, and so, yeah, so I'm like, yeah, the whole rule follower thing, I, you know, I get it. And, you know, cause sometimes I'm looking at scripture, I'm going, oh Lord, but, but they did the same thing that these other people did. I'm, I'm so confused as to why you wanted them to do it this way. And, and, you know, and the Lord is like, it's about relationship with me. Cause if they were talking to me and, you know, they were spending time with me, they would know that they would know what my heart is for that situation. Right. Right. And if you don't know somebody, you know, if you don't spend enough time with someone, you don't know their heart, you can make a guess, but quite often you're probably wrong. Mm, So good. So true. Yeah. So that, you know, as far as rule following, the Lord is, is really changing my heart around that. I mean, there's definitely things like, you know, you cannot murder, you know, just the, the, (laughs) The stuff that is, you know, standard issue, but, you know, when it comes to 
you know, dealing with people, dealing with brokenness, um, you know, getting God's heart about a situation is really, really important. And, you know, because I don't know, you know, I know that it's, it's rampant in the creative community where people look at other people and go, well, but they're doing this thing. And the Lord is like the problem with looking at somebody else and what I'm doing with them is I carved you different than I carved them. Right. So what, what could be, you know, a good thing for them could destroy you. Yes. Because that is not what, you know, that is not what I, I designed you to do. Right. Um, and so sometimes I'm like, oh, okay. All right, Lord. You know, I don't, I don't get it, but I hear what you're saying. And I know just because I've been spending time with you, how it is you want me to think about this situation. So yeah. Uh, oh, perfect example. I was listening to someone preaching and they were talking about the different kinds of prophets that, that are in scripture. Mm-hmm. And looking at the Old Testament, like Daniel was a prophet, Joseph was a prophet, David was a prophet, so was Moses, mm-hmm. you know, and you had Elijah and Elisha, and they were different kinds of prophets, right? Because, you know, Elijah and Elisha were like standing outside of the, the palace, throwing stones at the king and the queen, like, y'all are crazy, you're not doing what God said, you know? <laughs> naked person. <first. laughs> <laughs> right, right. And so like, you know, he's like, so those are people that were opposed to the people in authority. And then you have prophets like Joseph and Daniel who were prophets from God, but they were advisors to kings. And those kings didn't necessarily know God, but they were, peop- they were put in those positions by God to be their advisors. And, you know, somebody else could have looked at their situation and gone, ah, oh, they're a compromise, they're a sellout, you know. <laughs> and and it, wasn't a, it wasn't a compromise, it wasn't a sellout because that's where God called them, right? And then you could have people like Moses who, you know, Moses was a prophet, but he, you know, he heard from God directly, but he was also the leader. And so that was a different um, thing that a different place where God was putting him. Right. So, um, so they were saying all of that to say, don't look at what other people are doing. You need to spend time with God for yourself to figure out, what he wants to do with your life because that in that context you figure out what convictions are for you and what convictions are for somebody else that's really good and i love what you said where god's like what's good for them could destroy you i mm-hmm. mean you look in the bible of like the way that saul i just finished reading like saul and david you know that whole mm-hmm. thing what Saul did versus what David did and had mm-hmm. one just copied the other. And, you know, so many times in scripture, right. even Saul would say, well, this, um, you know, we want to worship your God, but he wasn't mm-hmm. saying my God. And I, yeah. always, I caught that a, yeah. like this time, like, why would he always just call it, call him Samuel's God or yeah. David's yeah. God. It was not his own personal God. And right. it ended up being, you know, his demise clearly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we really get that comparison bug, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially as women, um, we see, you know, girl over there succeeding, doing really good things. She's a quote unquote overnight success, which hashtag mm-hmm. nobody's an overnight success. <laughs> That's true. Like, why can't we just, if we just copy everything that she does, Mm-hmm. Which is 10 sessions on how to copy exactly what she does to be a success, right? Yeah. And we'll be just like her. And God's like, oh, no. Right. Right. <laughs> not at all. You're not right. her. I, did, I don't create co- carbon copies. You're a completely different person from her. You know, copy Rachel from Friends Haircut all you want all day long, sister. But like, you can't be like the other person, no matter how right. you try. Right. And if, and the thing is like, if you can copy somebody else to walk out the life that you, that God has created you for, you don't need God. Right. Exactly. Ooh, girl. And I'm just, (laughs) I'm just just like, "Ah, oh, oh yeah, that's the, okay. That's why you're not telling me all the things. Mm. I I remember a season when I was like, you know, I would read the, everybody's like, I think it was in Psalm 119, 103, I believe, as like your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want it to be a lamp because the lamp only shows you the next step. I need a searchlight. <laughs> and, and the Lord is like, no searchlight, darling. You just get the next step. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. We went through that season. Just me and my husband were starting a ministry and I was like, yeah. You know, I, I, it just felt like it was pitch black and I was just like holding on to this flickering candle, you know, yeah. I'm like, where is the stuff, you know, yeah. and I'm over here like, where's that, that light that they put on top of the, the lighthouse, right? That like turns around and turns around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, every once in a while you get a glimpse of something and you're like, yeah, oh, that's gotta be it. Right. You know, <laughs> I, I was reading during that time too. I think I was reading crazy love and it was like. Uh, and was like, do you uh, really want to know God's plan for your life? Uh, and, and his friend was like, no, are you kidding me? Because if I find out like a month from now, my spouse is going to die. My car is going to blow up and all this other stuff. I'm just going to mm -hmm. sit in the corner and cry and suck on my thumb. Right. Like, right. You know, I don't want to know your plan. <laughs> well, and that's the funny thing. That is so the funny thing because um, who was it? Someone said this the other day and I was like, wait a minute, let me think about it. Um, they said, um, if it would destroy you, the devil will tell you the truth. Ooh. I was like, I just got chills. I, I, I was like, wait, what, what? And no, I'm like, rewind. I need to hear that again. I'm like, what? That doesn't make any sense. And, and then they went on and they were like, that's why God said, don't use, um, you know, wizards and necromancers and palm readers and all this stuff because God, if you come to God, he will reveal it to you when he knows you can handle it. But if you go those routes, the devil will show it to you so he could destroy you and destroy your faith. You know, it was a few, like my daughter was probably a baby and one of my good friends, she was watching um, that show Long Island Medium. And mm. I love this lady. I think she's a great person uh, personally, but like she would say things that just like would wreck me. And I was like, this, and she's not even talking about me. Like she's mm -hmm. just talking about other people and these mm -hmm. horrible, horrible things that have happened to them or that might happen or like all this other stuff. And mm -hmm. I was like, how is this helpful to any, like, I cannot watch this show anymore with you because it's l like literally making me fearful for my life. at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. I, it's like that that disrupted the peace of my home you know mm -hmm. and like I know that like some people get you know peace from it or whatever especially if their loved ones have passed but at the same time like it was just, it was well, just crazy. but I mean but the thing that you have to you have to understand is there's a reason why God doesn't show you certain things yes because if so I told you that I'm full-time storytelling as a photographer for, you know, brands and weddings and portraits. Yeah. When the Lord called me away from what I was doing full-time for a job and called me to this, I was like, okay, you know, we're going to do this thing. It's going to be an adventure. I was yeah. scared spitless. Of course. But if at that time I knew that I would be sitting here going through this, I would have I would never have done it. No, I would never have done it, you know? And, but the reason I did it was because, okay, I say I trust God and he is my life. Am I going to trust him or am I going to trust what I can see? Mm. Um, and I'm just like, I trust God, <laughs> like question yeah. mark, you know? Yeah. And question right, right. And and so I was just like, okay, you know, I'm going to do this thing. And anyway, sorry, rabbit trail. <laughs> no, great rabbit. I'm a fan of the rabbit trail, sister. Like, <laughs> hop, come on. Um, so have you, um, were your parents be believers? Did you grow up yes. in the church as in a family of believers as well? Um, I, I grew up going to church. <laughs> yeah. I know. That that has its whole thing to it, right? Um, I grew up going to church, um, but I, I basically came from a nominal Christian family. You know, people are like, church is where you go, and that's what you do. Um, it wasn't necessarily, it, it didn't really change the way we, we thought or believed. It didn't change necessarily the culture in, in our home. Um, but when I found out, when I heard the gospel, um, 
message and about Jesus and what he did, that rocked my world. And I knew right then, this is exactly what I've been looking for. And I think I was like nine at the time. Um, but I had seen so many things, you know, things that I should not necessarily have known as a kid um, that I knew. Um, and just exposure to just how evil people could be. <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay, yeah. So, you know, at that point, before I came to know the Lord, before I heard the gospel and gave my life to Christ, I was just, I was looking. And I know it was definitely God drawing me. Um, but I was just like, you know, my cousin's going to church. She goes to a Catholic church. Let's go to church with her. Cause <laughs> you know, I might find something there, you know, or, you know, my other cousin's Anglican, you know, whatever. And I was just looking. Um, and it wasn't until I was in like boarding school. I think I was nine. I was in boarding school. And at that time, you know, we just, all the kids just had church together because, you know, you couldn't just have like a Methodist minister and an Anglican, a Catholic yeah. priest, you know, we just all went to church, you know, and we had somebody come and preach to us. And um, the day that I gave my life to Christ, this man, I don't even know, I don't even remember what he looked like, but I remember every word he said when he gave the gospel. He was like, you know, you're a sinner. I'm like, yep, check. <laughs> you know, like, I know that. Um, it was like, and you know, you have, you have fallen short of what God wanted. I was like, yep, I agree with that. You know, and, and he said, and God sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you so you could have a relationship with him. You know, my eyes got huge and I was like, tell me more, tell me more. And he was like, and so you can have a relationship with God if you would just accept Jesus. Um, because everything you need, Jesus did for you already. I was, I was ready walking down the aisle before he even made an altar call. That was just, you know, that was just where my heart was. Um, and it was really interesting because, you know, a lot of, you know, I want to say there were at least 20 or 30, at least 20 or 30 people that accepted Christ that day. And a lot of us, I was like nine at the time. And a lot of us, he just said, um, okay, this is good. It's good that, you know, you believe the message. And he was like, you need to know that a lot of people are going to come up against you, that you are too young to know what you did, that, mm -hmm. you know, that this stuff, that, you know, that this is not, that somebody just tricked you and you were too gullible and all this other stuff. And I'm, you know, after him giving the gospel message, I'm so grateful that the Lord just used him to say that to us because that next summer and fall, because I think it was like, it was like, you know, early year for us and through summer and fall, some things happened. Um, like one of my friends who, you know, she came to church because she's like, I get to hang out with my friends, but her family was Muslim. Mm. And when he gave the gospel message, she believed she accepted Christ. And um, when she went home, her father put her out of the house, like took her, took all her stuff. She's probably nine or 10, took her, took all her stuff and put her like in the middle of the marketplace and said, go find your family with your Jesus. You don't belong to my family anymore, mm. which was actually gracious because he could have beheaded her. And so um, it was amazing because, you know, another friend of mine who would, you know, she'd already known the Lord. She was in church at the time. Her family, you know, found out about it and basically took her in and raised her as their, as their kid, Wow. you know, through the rest of her height, you know, through the rest of school. And I was just like, what? Just, you know, and you're just like, wait, what? Um, and, you know, I had, you know, I had family members that were like, you're, you don't need to believe in Jesus. You're already a Christian. You were born a Christian, you know, <laughs> just mm -hmm. like you can't be born a Christian because, you know, and so that we just, you know, all of us that were there when he, when he spoke over us, you know, struggle, you know, we had our own struggles and we had the things that we needed to stand for, you know, like, do you really believe that Jesus is who he says he is? And, you know, and you had to stand. Mm -hmm. Um, because 
for some people it was life or death and for other people it was like your family's like we're going to disown you because you know you don't you don't know what you're talking about uh, yeah so <laughs> that was my, talk about talk that about was my experience i trust god period like there yes. goes the dot 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 right yes yes wow yeah and honestly i'm really glad i had that experience i know it was hard um because i pretty much spent my whole summer like being called into conversations with you know family members you don't need jesus what is this jesus stuff you know really? <laughs> it's just, yeah, it, was, it was like three months of that and i was just like oh, okay god i was like okay, okay so it was different <sighs> in that they mm -hmm. knew that they should go to church that's just what they do versus mm -hmm. this jesus guy like, right right and it's like you know this you, you don't need anything to change the way you live you know and i'm like okay mm -hmm. you know i'm like wow. i i know what i've i know what i experienced and i'm like i know what i i know what the lord did the yeah. day he saved me so there wasn't really anything that anybody could have said that would have taken and i know you know, it wasn't necessarily in my strength. It was just the Lord keeping me, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, it's so funny. Like we can say that now, like we see, you know, especially in America, like where um, people don't put the two together. Mm -hmm. right? But on the other side of everything, like once you've had a relationship with God and, and walked with him and stuff, you see like where so many people are missing out and just, um, taking the church part for granted and not inviting Jesus into it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. like, yeah. I mean, you would think, and I guess it kind of like blows my mind even now when I still run into people that are older than me that haven't realized mm -hmm. that. And I'm like, I don't, mm -hmm. what happened to you? I just like, I just, that just kind of blows my mind a little bit. Right. Well, I mean, to, to be fair, you don't get an understanding of who God is unless the Holy Spirit opens your mind. Right. There's just, I mean, you know, you could, because you could stare at a, at the Bible. I mean, anybody can read the Bible, right? But it's literally a brick wall to you unless the spirit opens it up. Yes. So true. It is just a boring old book. Unless right. like you right. have someone, you know, to help you kind of interpret. Right. Bit. And that's, and that's what the spirit does, right? Like he takes the words, puts it with God's heart and shows you, and you're like, Whoa, what's that always, you know, I'm, I find myself doing that every morning. Like, yeah. was that always there? Well, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and pulling my old Bible and like, was that scripture there? You know, I'm like, oh, it's, it's there. I underlined it. All right. Awesome. <laughs> I just wrote something very different next to it. It's I was just like, okay. Like that. that doesn't belong there anymore. You know? And I was just I like, mean, yeah. It was only Crazy. like a few years ago. I want to say it was probably maybe two or three years ago that I found out that people go to church, believe in Jesus, but don't believe in the Holy Spirit. And I was like, WT, how is that possible? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> how is that possible? How did you yeah. miss the boat on that? It's like yeah. when somebody tells me I've never seen friends. What? What is wrong with you? <laughs> It's not the same thing, but okay. <laughs> it's not, but it still blows your mind. It's kind of like, wait, what? Way. What is wrong with you? Where have you been? Under I, a rock? Yeah. I literally like called my mom because she was like my authority on so many things for so many years, you know. And I was like, <laughs> did you know that there's people that don't believe in the Holy Spirit? And she's like, <laughs> duh. Oh, like, oh The other thing that I probably heard only like a handful of years ago too is uh -huh. how even though I've read John like a million times right is how uh -huh. the word was God is God was with God in the beginning uh -huh. and the uh -huh. word is Jesus and you're like uh -huh. what like <laughs> you know <laughs> so I do have one more question okay. for you um you had talked about when you were young um uh -huh. having to you know, being the oldest, being responsible for raising uh, mm -hmm. your siblings, mm -hmm. um, for coming to the Lord, to looking for something, you know, looking for this mm -hmm. thing, knowing that you were a sinner at a young age, knowing that you needed yeah. to be saved by grace. Do you feel like you grew up too fast? Mm, yes and no. Right. Um, I feel like culturally I didn't. 
because in Nigerian culture, it's just what you deal with as being the oldest. Mm. Um, Can you explain but, that a little bit more? So um, in Nigerian culture, generally the, the kid that is the oldest is the one that helps their parents raise their siblings. Sure. Um, and that's just the way things are done culturally. Mm. Um, not necessarily the best thing to do, you know, because it kind of opens you up to certain things, but um, because you see things that you don't really understand and you may not have the capacity to comprehend and, you know, it kind of, it kind of isolates you a little bit because there are things, you know, that you really can't share with, with your siblings. Um, and that, you know, you know, that you can talk to your parents about, but chances are you never get a chance to, right? So that just, it, it's, it can leave you, um, isolated in a certain sense right is that the the evils that you're speaking about being the oldest kid and one of the one of the traditions is that when there are people in your family that die um somebody in the family should know that they're dead right so that somebody can't come in you know as an imposter and try and pretend to be this person that's already dead and so that's a thing. Uh, yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> she's like, she's like, what? That's so funny. So much. I just love this. <laughs> so, um, so I remember, like, you know, being told to like touch the hand of a dead person. <laughs> oh, you had to be the one that would confirm. Yes. Yes. Wow. So, like, my parent, my parents knew, but I had to confirm some, like, physically confirm, right? Because I'm a kid and you know, just telling me that the person is dead may or may not register. So you're like touching somebody that's dead and you're like, oh God, this feels weird. <laughs> you know? You're like, no, I'm not, mom, dad, I can't go in the medical profession. I'm ruined for life. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just like, okay, you know. I'm like, going to be an artist. <laughs> <laughs> going to do that. Oh, that, that can't, girl, that story is a whole different story. And <laughs> you need a different podcast for that one. But, um, but so like, I knew those things, right? I knew like who had died and, you know, like when they died and, you know, that, those kinds of things. And so I'm just like, okay, people die, you know, and sometimes people die because other people kill them, you know, and I'm just like, and you're just like, whoa, you know, and like your brain is exploding because that's not really something you talk about with kids necessarily, right? Yeah. And so like, so seeing things like that, you're just like, ah! <laughs> I need somebody to help me with this because I don't understand. And, you know, so. Like, because your parents worked all the time, that's why you didn't have a chance to kind of digest that with them? No, or? no my, uh, my parents were professional parents. Um, they, they were like, yeah, we're walk, we're working, but we're going to be home. You know, my dad, I love my dad. Cause you know, my dad's like, okay, I'm on my lunch break. So like on his lunch break, he would come pick us up make sure we ate, start us off doing our homework before he went back to work. <laughs> that was like my dad. That was my dad, right? And so as far as that goes, yeah. But, you know, how do you, my thing was like, how do you ask the questions, right? Mm, how, do you have um, for how do you have language for something like that? Like, it's not something that, it's not something that siblings, you know, have language for it's not something that you're taught necessarily to have language for you know it's just it's it wasn't necessarily that they weren't available to talk about it but it's like where do you start you know what sparks the conversation you know what yeah. I mean yeah. and so it's yeah so that was that was the challenge um it's like waiting for your kids to come and talk to you about when they want to talk about sex it's like <laughs> It's not gonna happen. <laughs> and so yeah, so it was you know, it's just so in, in that sense it was like culturally, you know, as a kid, you know, you talked about simple things and you you know, you were talking you talked about school and being a good student and being responsible and you know, that sort sort of thing. But the 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 things that you were exposed to that just didn't necessarily fit in one box or another, you're just like, What do I say? What do I do? you know. How do I process this? You know, so that's, that's what I meant. Your upbringing in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Are you grateful for that? Having that kind of experience and then coming back stateside? 
Um, yes. Uh, if you had asked me this question several years ago, eh, maybe a different question, different right. answer. Um, but I definitely am right now. Um, I can I can see how the Lord is redeeming what was meant to destroy me mm. for my good. Um, like you know the thing I was telling you about being able to like hear hear people's words and be okay not to share it with anybody mm-hmm. definitely you know definitely spending time with the lord and processing okay lord so and so said this thing to me should i say anything to them <laughs> you know like yeah. you know, those kinds of things like processing with the lord is fine but um but i appreciate um being able to be a woman that holds people's words closely um mm-hmm. realizing that not every not everyone is trustworthy and not any not everyone can be trusted with other people's words yes um, yes so i'm grateful for that and the other you know the, there's several other things but the other thing that just jumped into my my heart right now is um it has given me a real love for people right mm. um not in a weird you must be perfect way but in a okay i know you're not perfect but you don't have to be perfect for me to love you right right? um and it's given me it's given me some dimension of understanding god's love for me right because i'm just like um can we say that i was messed up before you found me (laughs) (laughs) you know um but just just grateful you know grateful for you know the scriptures where the lord says i'm a new creation because you know people are like i'm just a sinner saved by grace i'm like you could say that about yourself but not for me because Jesus <laughs> told me that i'm a new creation like everything is gone it's covered you know and so just understanding that god found me in a messed up place but he doesn't expect me to stay there yeah right um and you know he the fun, the fun thing is like i think it was like 2012 for two years god dealt with me Uh, this is just an example of what he's done like dealing with my character for two years he was like whenever you say something you do it Mm -hmm. i'm like i'm like yes lord you know and i didn't think i had a problem with this right (laughs) except yeah except and he's like yeah yeah you said you're gonna do it and you're gonna do it and he's like and even if you only tell me that you're gonna do it you have to do it yeah and so for two years, like the Lord just with me in the shape around that. And so sometimes people will come to me, hey, send me you. And I'm like, nope. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm so like I love that. I had something similar, but like when I was younger, um, somebody that was close to me and not close with anymore, but mm-hmm. told me, you never finish anything you start. And it was like a bitter pill to swallow. And it has Uh, created this like anger inside of me. That's like, I'm going to finish everything. now. (laughs) And even if it's like one way to get motivated, (laughs) even if it's like an awful book, I have to finish it. (laughs) My best friend's like, why don't you just put it down? If it's a bad book, I'm like, because I I started it. I start. (laughs) <laughs> That's hilarious. It made me a better person. I don't know. I do finish things now. So That's too I would funny. like to think so. I like to think that so. Is so hilarious. Girl. Oh. Yeah, the things God will do to the yeah. Well, can you share with everybody if they want to connect with you to be mm-hmm. able to um see your work or get to work with you or follow you on social media because you are a delight of like oh, wisdom a wisdom fountain. I love it. I'm going to make like 10 memes and underneath them will put Simmy. So. You yeah, maybe I'll, here. No. Maybe I'll send you a picture to go with. No. Um, uh, gosh, on Instagram, I have way too many accounts, but my main ones are Uche Photography and Uche Brand Imagery. Um, that's for like client work that I've done and art by Simmy, which is um, for some of my photo artwork and just other fun stuff that I do. Um, and then on 
Facebook, Uche Photography, and Uche Brand Imagery as well. Um, Why Uche? Um, Uche is my middle name. <clears throat> Actually, Uche is short for Uchenna, which means um, father's nature or like father, uh, which I, I love because I'm a total daddy's girl. Uh, and I also love because, you know, my heavenly father, you know, being like my heavenly father is not a bad thing. Okay. So, um, yes. And since Uche means likeness, it was just perfect for, you know, businesses about imagery. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for this conversation. Oh, you're welcome. I know you. I'm getting to hear about you. And I hope people go and look at your work because it's amazing. And you oh, are. You, you're a storyteller. I love it. Thank you, love. Thank you. I appreciate you. If you want to catch up with me in between podcast episodes, you can always find me on Instagram at MRS, Mrs. Wendy J. Olson, O-L-S-O-N. This is where I post coordinating IGTV videos. I also write a blog where things that come into my head come out onto my keyboard and onto the internet. Be sure to catch up with me there. My website is wendyjolson.com. Interested in being coached by me? Head over to my coaching page on my website. You can also check out where I'm hosting groups, where I'll be speaking, everything health and wellness, and don't forget book recommendations on my book club page. Thanks again for listening. Make sure you subscribe. And if you haven't already, we'd love it if you take a minute and leave us a review. We love five stars. Tell us what you're loving. We recently created a Patreon account. This is where you can participate in supporting the podcast, the blog, and a scholarship program for my coaching services for women who can't afford coaching on their own. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Mrs. Wendy J. Olson. Thanks again for your support. I look forward to chatting with you again next week.